Good morning, everybody, and welcome to what I think is the 16th edition of Hawkbogger Mornings. I'm Brian Nemhauser, and I am uh, in new digs today. So took my youngest and my oldest uh, to the Hood, Hood Canal here in the Hood Sport area and brought my equipment with me. So hopefully you're able to hear me okay. Please let me know if it's too quiet or too loud or anything else. I won't be able to help if it's too echoey. That's just kind of the nature of things when I'm out here uh, in these types of digs. But good morning to everybody. I hope you're enjoying your Tuesday morning. And man, it has, it's been a lot to have all the guests on and talk to folks and get different perspectives. Yesterday we had Brady Henderson, which was great. We will definitely have Brady back on the show in future weeks and would love to, to go into more detail about what he's learning. Um, and yes, Max is asking if that is the hood canal behind me. It is, it is. We got a great little spot here right off the canal. Definitely going to take a little dinghy out after this and see if we can uh, paddle out there a bit, see what we can find. Maybe we'll grab some oysters. Who knows? Should be a good day. Uh, weather yesterday was absolutely Typical of the Northwest, uh, pouring out here, but we enjoyed the hot tub. And then today looks like it's going to be a gorgeous day. So we're really going to try to make the most of it. I um, want to say good morning to Michael Fawcett, uh, a member on the YouTube channel. Really appreciate the support. You should have a link in the chat pinned and in the description of the video that lets you join as a YouTube member as well. One of the perks that I have added for being a club level member on YouTube or a suite level member is that if I have extra time in any of these Hawk Blogger mornings, I will open it up to questions from those folks. So I think this is a nice balance of keeping chat open for everybody. There's things like members only chat and we'll do some things like that, but I, I think people enjoy having more people in chat and so restricting it for these shows. I don't know if that that's my favorite choice, but I will pay attention to questions from people that are specifically club level and suite level. And I'll call out on the show when we're ready for some questions to go into that. And sometimes I'll just take those questions as we go. But that's something that I will look to do for club level and suite level folks in particular. So if you have joined as a YouTube member, nothing's stopping you from upgrading to being a club club level. I mean, a lot of folks would love to be club level at, at CenturyLink, a uh, little more expensive to do that. Being a club level or a suite level member for this channel, much more affordable and a great way to support the show. All right. Um, so today's show, we're going to go back to our roots where this show began, which is kind of obsessing over some of the positions that we want to know more about and learn more about and um, hear what other people are saying about some of these players that might be Seahawks. And we've done one on linebackers. We've done one on defensive tackles. And quite honestly, I didn't feel like we even got to the depth I wanted to on defensive tackle. There were guys that I wanted to get. We still haven't talked about Brandon Dorless for gosh sakes. You know, like there's guys I'd like to spend more time on and we should have time to do that before the draft. But there's a whole position group that we haven't even you know, scratched the surface of other than just superficial conversation on the show. And that's interior offensive line, which is arguably the top priority and the biggest hole on this roster. So I want to spend this morning going into a little bit more detail on what we're finding with interior offensive linemen. And like we did before, I'm going to look at different big boards where they're ranked. I'm going to look at different um, uh, scout assessments and uh, you know, we'll, we'll see if there's specific guys that you're interested in me looking at um, and you are a YouTube member or a Patreon supporter, patreon.com slash hawkblogger, feel free to drop that in the channel. And if I'm able to do that, I will make those a priority. All right. So with that in mind, um, uh, I guess uh, one more thing, I guess news of the morning, a couple things just to, to follow up on. Uh, the Seahawks did report for workout programs starting yesterday. Brady Henderson, after our show, did report 
that Uchenna Nwosu was in one of the pictures, which is good news as he's recovering from that pectoral injury. That shouldn't be a surprise. Pec injuries are not, you know, something to be worried about being able to recover from, and especially in the time frame of when he was hurt. But it's still good news to see that he was there. Um, I don't know that there's a much other big news out of that, um, you know, workout program and the, literally looking at pictures to see who's there. Uh, other thing that I think is worthy of some news is Tavondre Sweat. We talked about this yesterday and on Sunday when the news broke that he was arrested um, for DWI. And since then, we've learned that there was a car accident. Apparently, he was driving or he was in one of the cars. I think he was driving one of the cars. That would make sense if you're getting a DWI. Um, and that the he was driving an SUV. They hit a sedan. This was like 430 in the morning. And the driver of the sedan left the scene, which is a little odd. So I'm curious what that's going to turn out to be. Um, and I mean, I'm not going to speculate, but obviously if if somebody leaves the scene, it, it raises some suspicion that they might have done, had some more to do with what went on. But who knows? We'll find out. Additionally, and probably more importantly for the Seahawks, it was announced yesterday that he, Tavondre Sweat, is going to be visiting the Seahawks um, later this week. I think Thursday was supposedly the day that he was going to visit or is going to visit. And we don't know. We don't know if that's a visit that was asked for because of this incident or it was already planned and just coincidentally came after this incident. But here's my read. Could be way off, but here's my read. And you know my biases. This is a guy who I think is such a great fit for what the Seahawks need. Knowing what his risks are, uh, still, you know, I think from a football player profile, he has unique skills that could really help elevate the Seahawks defense. My read is the Seahawks were always interested and that now that this issue has come up, that they want to talk to him about what, what what happened. They want more details. They want to look him in the eye. They want to see how he handles it. They want to see if there's any uh, responsibility, regrets, ownership. Um, and if he can put their concerns at ease, then he remains someone that they'd look to draft. The other way to look at it is, Maybe the Seahawks didn't think they could get him because he's likely a second round pick. But now with this news, maybe it's more likely he could drop to the third round, be available at 81, even if they don't get a second round pick. And so now they're more interested in him from an evaluation perspective because they didn't think this was somebody that they would likely have a chance to draft and now might have an, a bigger chance to draft. So I don't know. Um, None of us know exactly why, but the fact that they're having on a visit is meaningful. The Seahawks have drafted a lot of the guys that they've had on visits, and if they had no interest, they wouldn't be having a visit is the simplest way to think about it. So um, let's get in here now and look at interior offensive linemen. And uh, apologies, you're going to see me looking down because normally I have my screens uh, right next to the camera, but I got my laptop on on here today. So you're going to see uh, that. Hopefully you're just listening and not even watching it. But uh, the bonus is you get to see the background, beautiful hood canal behind me. Um, so that's a bonus. Um, all right. So I'm going to spend less time. I'm going to spend less time on some of the names that we already know, right? Like everybody knows. Troy Fautanu. Everybody knows Talisi Fuaga. Everybody knows Graham Barton at this point, right? These are all guys we know. I think we will probably talk a little bit about Jackson Powers Johnson, but not a lot. I just, I've spent less time talking about him and I think it's worth at least covering there. Um, but we're going to start kind of there. We're going to get into the Cooper BBs. We're going to talk like the Jordan Morgans, the Christian Haynes, um, Zach Zinter, uh, and then we'll get even farther down the list. We've talked about Dominic Pooney, but we'll take a, a look at him. Um, Matt Goncalves, uh, we'll look at him. Uh, Kingsley Suamataya, um, I think is a tackle, but maybe a guard prospect. We'll talk about Christian Mahogany. Um, we might talk a little bit about Sata Oa Laumea, 
from Utah. Um, I don't think we'll talk about Roger Rosengarten. We probably will talk about Brandon Coleman. Um, so we'll see how far we get. Usually we get to about seven of these guys because uh, there's a lot of information. Hopefully we can cover a little bit more ground. Um, and I'd like to get into some of the names that we've spent less time on. Uh, so the real quick of it is, you know, first round guys that that make sense for the Seahawks to be considering are Talisa Fuaga, who a lot of people think is just the best right tackle in this draft and just a, would be a kick-ass guard as well. I just don't see him being available. So not going to spend much more time. We've talked about him a lot. Troy Fautanu, the most mocked player to Seattle of any player, makes a ton of sense to go to the Seahawks. Could be the pick. Um, he also may not be available. Graham Barton, who we've talked about, played left tackle in college, is... Most people say he would be best as a center, but also could be a really good guard. Um, you know, we heard from Rob Rang. We heard from others. We heard from Wes McLean, um, Brandon Thorne, that, you know, he's a guy that fits in the list of Pro Bowl level guards that you could get in this draft. And one of the one of the guys that one of the only guys that really reaches that level. So those are a few. I, I do want to I want to take a quick look at Amarius Mims. Now, Amarius Mims is 6'8", 340 pounds, and uh, has 36-inch arms. I think he is almost certainly just going to be a tackle. There has been some conversation about the fact that he could be a guard. And so I want to take a quick look just to see if there's any, um, any mention of guard play in his uh, different... In his different um, scouting looks, um, so far I'm not seeing anything that fits that with him. So we're, we're going to keep moving. Strike one, Mary Smims. Um, but an interesting player nonetheless. Uh, so let's talk about Jackson Powers Johnson. So Jackson Powers Johnson out of Oregon. Um, I, hold on one second. So I remember one thing that I that I mentioned to folks, and I should reset. And when we went through defensive tackles, and we went through, uh, we went through linebackers. Is there's different grading systems for these players, and one that I'm going to be looking at at least first on here is the one that Lance Zerline uses uh, on NFL.com, and that's an eight point grading scale, and so. If you, for example, uh, if you are over a 6.0, you'll be, you have a potential to be an above average backup, but there's a lot of gradation between those different spots. If you want to be a Pro Bowl talent, you get up to 7, 7.0. Uh, year one starter is 6.7. So I guess the things that we paid attention to last time, and I think is fine for now, is um, how many are at, 6.0 or above, and then 6.3 to 6.39. 6.3 and above will eventually be a plus starter. So 6.3 is a pretty high quality prospect. And one of the things I want to point out here, there was there was very few. I'm not going to go back and do linebacker and, and defense tackle. There's many more defensive tackles than there were linebacker. But to give you an idea, I'm going to do a quick count here, which everyone loves watching people count. Now, this is all offensive linemen. This includes tackles, so keep that in mind. Well, actually, let me just try to... I'm going to try to just count the folks that count as interior linemen. So, uh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 12... 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 19 guys that are 6.0 or above. Okay. And we're going to actually maybe get to some guys that are below 6.0 because I think they're graded more highly on other um, pieces, but that's a lot. That's a lot of guys. Um, and where does Jackson Powers Johnson fit? He is a 6.36. What is a 6.36 in that scale? If you remember, 6.30 to 6.39 is will eventually be a plus starter. If you want by comparison, uh, Graham Barton is 
uh, Talisi Fawaga is 6.48. Troy Fautanu is 6.47. So 4.6, 4.7, 4.8 for those guys. What that equates to is um, that is will become a good starter within two years. Okay. So not the highest, but but much higher than um, Jackson Powers Johnson. So Lance Zerline's NFL comparison for Jackson Powers Johnson is Quinn Miners. Okay. And uh, talks about him being a broadly built center prospect, below average length, but above average body power. Johnson Powers, Powers Johnson isn't much of a knee bender, which impacts his pad level and drive leverage. He can torque and toss opponents around with some regularity at the point. He's a fierce competitor, salty disposition, but needs to improve his first phase technique to create more consistent block sustains. Despite average athleticism, he doesn't seem to have many issues in pass protection as he works with clear eyes, wide base, good discipline. His rookie season could be bumpy if he has to play early, but he should come out the other side as a long time starter. So one of the things I I've noticed with Jackson Powers Johnson is I think he's a little bit more scheme specific than some of these other guys. Graham Barton to me is someone I, I I have a bias towards interior linemen that are strong and can be athletic and move um, uh, wide like pullers. And that's good for something like a wide zone running game. Now, uh, as far as what Ryan Grubb did at UW, he mixed his running game. So there was some wide zone, but there's also, you know, interior, you know, uh, plays as well. and where Jackson Powers Johnson can excel is really getting to the next level vertically. Um, that's what we heard. I think it was from Brandon Thorne. It might've been from Rob Rang. I can't remember, but essentially a guy that, that climbs to the next level. And I'm interested in guys that can um, get outside. Graham Barton is a perfect example of a guy that has that kind of athleticism. So is Troy Fautanu. So like those are two guys that are really good, both uh, on the inside and on creating outside opportunity. I feel like Jackson Powers Johnson is more limited that way. I also feel like Jackson Powers Johnson is very clearly best as a center and he can play guard, but I think that's a different thing. I think Graham Barton could be, I think he could be his best at guard, but could definitely play center and be a very good center. Troy Fautanu can play tackle, be a good tackle, especially right tackle if they needed that. And I think can be an outstanding guard. I don't think he's a center. I would rather guys with tackle experience moving to guard than guys with center experience moving to guard. Um, and so that's where for me, Jackson Powers Johnson is a little bit lower on my list. I, I wouldn't be upset with them drafting him, but he's not a guy that I'm just, you know, a huge fan of um, for what the Seahawks need. Uh, looking at what PFF says here, Powers Johnson possesses starting caliber power and finesse traits. Um, at center or guard for both zone or man block gap blocking concepts. He's dominant enough to, at his position to be considered a top 20 pa uh, talent. Um, he has uh, short arms um, is, is one thing that they call out. Uh, and they do talk about him being able to climb to the second level, as I was just kind of talking about. I think he's that kind of that kind of blocker. So a good player moving on. Um, Another guy that I wanted to spend a little bit of time on is Jordan Morgan. Now, I think most people just have him as a tackle. This is uh, out of Arizona. He has a 6.36 grade as well, same as Jackson Powers Johnson. He is six foot five, 311 pounds. He has 32 and 7 eighths inch arms, so not the longest arms for a tackle. Um, ran a 5.040, oh, 17 split, 28 inch vertical jump. Like explosive scores are not that great. I would be looking at Raz, but oh, there we go. Finally, was not loading. Um, and let me pull up these guys. Um, so Jordan Morgan had a 9.25 um, Raz score. And to give you an idea there, this is again, the relative athletic score. We had Kentley Platy on with us a little bit ago. He had elite speed. His explosion was only good. His vertical was in, you know, over the 50th percentile, but still not that high. 
Um, his height for tackle is in the 30th, 39th percentile. That's part of why some people with his arm length and the height, that's a double, it's kind of a double hit from a length perspective as a tackle. And so I think there's some people are talking about kicking him into guard. Uh, as we look at Lance Zerline's um, view of him, three-year starter, displayed resilience and work ethic coming back and playing good football after suffering a torn ACL in 2022. Morgan is fluid and flexible in space, the ability to help spring running plays with second level blocks and play side lead blocking. He fails to secure backside cutoffs too frequently, but improving his pad level landmarks might fix that issue. His punch diminishes his pass protection length. His punch approach diminishes his pass protection length and causes him to lose connection with the top of the rush. Well, he's also short and has shorter arms. He needs to get his hands and feet synced up in order to improve his balance and consistency against athletic rushers. He's a capable run blocker. Okay, so another thing towards potentially having potential as a guard. Uh, he features projectable upside with more work. Morgan has the traits and talent to become a solid starting left tackle. Uh, interesting. Yeah, nothing there. Uh, nothing there that I think changes much. Let's just see what we get here from. PFF on that on Jordan Morgan. So they give him an 87 pass block grade, a 77 run block grade um, in true pass sets. And, and again, for people that don't know, true pass sets are when they it's a known passing play. So defense and offense know what's coming. He had a 78 pass block grade in those situations. And they talk about Morgan needs to get stronger, whether he plays tackle or guard in the NFL. So there's one of the places that sees him as potentially a guard, but he has desirable athletic traits such as fast hands and feet that boast, bolster his starting caliber potential. Um, Bol Morgan's a smooth moving prospect whose best position in the NFL might be guard. His track and field background gives him natural balance and core strength and good change of direction ability. His arm length isn't elite for offensive tackle clay, but should be adequate. His footwork is fast and his strides are in uh, the his kick slider short. His hand placement, patience and football IQ are all pluses. Though he's listed at 325 pounds, he lacks density and strength. Bull rushers can overwhelm him if they come at an angle. And though he has the foot speed to stay in front of pass rushers, he doesn't have the natural strength to redirect their momentum. He's also a little bit on the older side. He's going to be he's 22 and a half. He's going to be 23. But I think this is a guy that's, worth kind of being aware of that we have not talked about he is for pff he is the 40th ranked prospect on their big board outside the first round but very squarely in the second round so is this one of the guys the seahawks could consider as a second round prospect if they do go defense in the first round I think it's a guy to keep an eye on. Um, not the most likely, but I think is a guy that we haven't talked about. So I wanted to make sure we did talk about him here. Uh, quick comment here from one of our members here, Nitzel Toy 01. I do worry a little bit about Jackson Powers Johnson. The ball came out so quick in Oregon. The average depth of target for Bo Nix was just like crazy low. Yeah, I, I, like I said, I'm not an anti Jackson Powers Johnson guy. I just feel a little bit more like he is limited to center. And while he probably is better than the center options we currently have, I'm not sure he can lift the level of play for that team as much as like an elite guard could. And I don't know that I see him as an elite guard for what I think the Seahawks are going to be looking for. Uh, all right. So next on the list, Cooper Beebe. Now this guy is, you know, I've heard different things from different people. So there are folks that love Cooper Beebe because he has played every spot on the line, pretty much sometimes multiple spots in the same game. He's played, you know, left guard and right tackle in the same game for Kansas state. He has, you know, hundreds of snaps at, you know, both guards and tackle positions and, has just has a lot of football under his belt. And so a lot of people are big fans. Other folks feel like he's a little bit more limited in what he's capable of. And um, 
uh, let's just talk about his numbers and who he is. So he played for Kansas State. He is uh, six foot three, 322 pounds. So like kind of classic guard uh, size, not overly large. Arms 31 and a half inches, not big um, for sure. Right, relatively small hands, nine and a quarter. Um, and ran a five, three, 40, one, seven, five, 10 yard split, pretty low on the vertical jump, 27 and a half, nine, one broad. So if I pull him up on Raz, I think what we're going to find is that um, he was probably pretty low on Raz. Let's take a look. Not too bad, actually. Um, let's see why. So Cooper BB on the Raz score. Um, his speed grade was elite. That's where he really shined. So 40 yard dash, 20 yard split, 10 yard split are all basically 90th percentile kind of grades. His agility grade, and these are the grades that when we talk to Kent Lee Platty and we've you talk to PFF folks, the ones that actually correlate most for success in the NFL as a guard are going to be the shuttle and the three cone drill. Okay. And for Cooper BB, he had elite grades for those. For the shuttle, he had 461, which was 87th percentile. For three cone, he had 744. That was 95th percentile. So that's a pretty positive note. The explosion is a little concerning. It's it, He gets a good score at um, only 60th percentile for vertical. And I think this is where, when you get into the overall RAS score, his overall RAS score is 9, 9.28. So like 93rd percentile athlete at the position. That factors in his size and his weight is 620 or 322. That's a 81st percentile weight for guard. And so that's pretty good. His bench press, by the way, just so you know, 20, um, 27th percentile. He only benched uh, 225, 20 reps. Um, his height at 6'3 is 40th percentile. So I guess for me, I struggle. I still, I have biases. You know this. I haven't loved, I, like Cooper BB for me seems like a solid player. I don't know if I see a guy that is a above average, like solidly above average player. Maybe he can be Damian Lewis, you know, like that, that level of guy. I, I am dreaming <laughs> to have something really dom someone really dominant join at the guard position with really dominant potential i'm not sure i see that in cooper bb let's see what pff says pff is very big like I, I, there's some people at pff that are very big on cooper bb um he only ranks 126th in their big board which is actually pretty quite quite low uh his run block grade was 79.9 9. personally i always want guards run block grades to be as high as possible. I want the power because if they're not demonstrating the power and the precision of run blocking in college, generally they're going to have even a harder time going up against the, the NFL level defensive tackles. Pass block grade is great, but you have help when you're a guard, you have someone on either side of you. You've got a center and you got a tackle. And so you can hide some of those pass blocking issues, but he gets a wonderful pass block grade of 90 in a true pass set, his pass block grade goes up to 91, which is good. Uh, his zone grade and his gap grade, those are different types of running schemes, are both reasonably good. 81 in a zone, uh, 76 in gap. And it makes sense. BB looks like a guy who's a decent mover. And so he is a guy that can get out if you're running outside zone and things of that nature. Uh, here's PFF's take on him. BB's high football IQ, sh IQ should lead to a long NFL career. Unfortunately, have his athletic limitations will likely limit that career to that of a backup swing lineman. BB brings experience and versatility from his Kansas State career with 48 starts combined at left guard, left tackle, and right tackle. He is well built for the interior with a thick lower body, upper body, and midsections. His trump, his trump card is his football IQ. He has an impressive understanding of why the fundamentals win at the position, leverage, hand placement, angles, timing, and he leaves, but he leaves much to be desired as an athlete. He does not get off the ball with explosiveness and does not convert speed to power at the punch often. His feet are heavy and he struggles to recover against twitchier pass rushers. 
Let's see what Lance Zerline says. Wide body guard who has been the model of consistency over the last four years, dialing in a very firm brand of football. While hand placement can be a little inconsistent, we heard that now twice, BB is still a bulldozer in cleats who jolts smaller player and moves big ones against their will. A lack of arm length will test him in certain interior matchups in the pros. We talked about that. And he will need to improve his technique to bolster his block sustain. His slow of foot, he's slow of foot and is likely to be pigeonholed into downhill oriented rush attacks. Interesting because his RAS grades for his speed were elite, but he talks about him being slow of foot. But he's never never prevented him from being a good in pass protection. BB's experience, girth, and dry blocking should make him a longtime starter who can step in right away. So Zerline's much higher on him than um, PFF and his comp for Cooper BB, which I think is a decent one is Kevin Zeitler. Clearly he was a guy that the Seahawks or like we were hoping the Seahawks would consider, you know, if you could have add a young Kevin Zeitler to the line, that would be great. He gives him a 6.29 grade, which means he will eventually be an average starter. Um, Get a comment here from Michael Fawcett, who is one of our uh, high-level YouTube members. I'm happy you're doing a video like this. If Schneider sticks to his plans of not overdrafting guard, even if we trade back, I feel doubtful he will take a guard in his first two picks. Yeah, that's kind of why I want to spend some time here looking at some of these other players that are not first-round prospects and maybe not even second-round prospects for the Seahawks. Next on the list, uh, let's talk about Christian Haynes. Now, Christian Haynes is an interesting one. Um, I think is a pretty good guard, but I believe he has only played right guard in his career. And from what I've heard and read that he may not be a guy that projects as easily moving over to left guard. And since you've got Anthony Bradford already as your right guard, what does that mean? Um, so that's a question there. Uh, Lance Zerline, well, let's talk about height and weight. He's 6'3", 317. Uh, a little bit lighter, 33 and a half inch arms. So longer arms, still like smallish hands, nine, nine inch hands. Um, ran a 5040, 175 split, 33 inch vertical. So better vertical, eight, six broad. That's not so great. A little bit better on bench press, 25 reps where BB was 20. Um, Zerline says he's a four-year starter and team captain who's sturdy at the point of attack. Haynes plays with football intelligence and sees every snap as a mandate to move opponents and finish blocks. His draft slotting could be affected by the lack of length and being limited to one position is what I'm talking about, but his determined to playing style counters those factors. He's not overly rangy, but wipes out targets on pulling blocks and is capable in space and in pass protection. The hand usage can get sloppy, allowing opponents to slip away from him. And he has a tendency to do too much grabbing. All things considered, he might outplay his draft slotting and become a solid NFL starter. Let's see what PFF has for him here. Um, I believe he's higher ranked. Let's just see where they've got. Yeah, Christian Haynes is 64th. So they had Cooper Beebe um, at 126th. Christian Haynes way, way up here, relatively speaking, at 64th for PFF. Run block grade of 80, pass block grade of 82.5. So a stronger, slightly stronger pass, a run block grade than he, than uh, Cooper BB. Zone grade 89. Interesting. So gap grade 64, better zone blocking player. And in his true pass set, he declines pretty significantly in his pass block grade to 74. So you know, when they know they're going to pass block, he is getting beaten uh, more often. Obviously, he's at Connecticut. This is Jim Moore Jr. So the Seahawks, he's the coach there. Seahawks have a little bit more information about Christian Haynes, most likely. They have connections with Jim Moore Jr. Uh, what they say about him on PFF. Haynes showed in his tape and at the Senior Bowl that he has starting potential measurables and traits at guard in the NFL. His best work comes on the move which would bode well for a zone blocking scheme and as a puller for man gap schemes. We don't know yet exactly how that's going to play out for the Seahawks with Scott Huff and Ryan Grubb taking over from what we saw at university of Washington. They definitely, there were some 
there was some definitely power blocking inside that's going on and it was not all zone kind of blocking. So, I mean, UW's guards were large men. Um, their centers were not, but their guards were. And so I, I don't know if a guy like Christian Haynes, if that's his profile is really a good fit. Um, let's just take out, check out his Raz score quickly. Uh, Christian Haynes has a decent Raz score. Uh, he is, comes out overall at a 9.1, 91st percentile for guards. He was elite on speed, um, 93, 93rd, 90, almost 94th percentile and 40 yard dash, uh, 90th percentile and all the splits. He did not do agility testing. So that's a big deal because as we just talked about three cone and shuttle are the two most highly correlated for guards with projecting production in the NFL. The fact that he didn't do that is a little bit concerning. Uh, composite explosion grade is good. His broad jump's not great. His size grade is just okay. Height, 23rd percentile. Weight, 74th percentile. Bench press, 64th percentile. Okay, so I don't know that Christian Haynes is a guy that makes a ton of sense for the Seahawks but it's certainly a guy that could get drafted early on the interior line. Let's keep going. Zach Zinter. Really looking forward to diving in here. This is a guy that I've really liked. He's coming off an injury. I thought looked like one of the better guards in this class. Some people don't agree. So what does Lance Zerline say? First of all, he grades him as a 6.24, which will eventually be an average starter. So not super high on him. He's six foot six, 309 pounds, so taller for sure. 33 and a half inch arms, longer. So he's taller and longer, uh, a little bit lighter. Uh, hand, hand size nine and three eighths, so larger than the other two guys. Um, his uh, comparison that Lance Ger Zerline gives him is Graham Glasgow. So, you know, a little, he's been a starter for a lot in the, in the league, but never truly like a great player. Zinter enters the league with NFL size, toughness, and technique. Starts well. That's kind of how I see him. He is an average athlete in short spaces, but is very capable of climbing to the second level with good angles and making hits on short pulls. He can be stood up and neutralized by two gapping pluggers, but is rarely beaten soundly. His pass protection will be average by NFL standards. Active rushers will give him more issues than you might like. Zinter's draft stock might be hindered by the recovery from his injury, but the tape suggests he will be a starter at the next level. Well, yeah, I think so too. Strengths uh, brought across the upper body, thick hips, adequate length, takes smart angles, second level climber. Um, well, what's his weaknesses? Uh, coming back from a broken tibia and fibula suffered in late November, right? So Broken bones are not the worst thing to come back for from like that shouldn't. It's not like I, I'd rather that than an ACL, to be totally honest. Uh, two gappers can punch and separate from him. So two gappers, again, for people that don't know, uh, defensive linemen, if they are playing off of either one of the offensive linemen's shoulders, they can go left or they can go right. That's two gapping. If they are one gappers, they are picking a gap and they're going off of one shoulder of that lineman. That's their gap and they're going to get to it. So it sounds like people that are basically a lot of times two gap technique on defensive linemen, they will, they will grab the offensive lineman so that then they can shed in either direction, depending on which gap they want to get to. It sounds like those types of players are in that type of scheme that are strong enough to do that can, can basically punch and separate away from uh, Zinter from Zerline's perspective. Um, has trouble making recoveries when beaten. Okay. I mean, that's not exactly the most damning profile. Let's see. PFF is much lower. I'm going to have to look him up one second here. Mr. Zinter is 160 on their board. Way, 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 way down the board. Okay. He got a 76 grade as a run blocker. He got a 74 grade as a pass blocker. So these aren't great grades. They're not bad, but they're not great. 
zone grade uh, 73, gap grade 72. So he was kind of fine in either one. His true pass set pass block grade 63. So when the other teams knew it was a passing situation, he didn't do so well. Um, so these aren't great grades. Uh, if I look his progression over from 2021, he got a 66 grade, 2022, a 75 grade, 2023, basically 77 grade. What they say is Zinter's movement limitations will likely limit him to man gap schemes. Uh, meaning they don't think he can be like a wide zone kind of guy if he's to be successful at the next level, but he does have sufficient power to get a shot at a starting role at some point in such systems. He's a powerful interior offensive lineman whose skill set and size fit perfectly with Michigan's power running scheme. He carries a lot of weight in his upper half, giving him good power to push people at, con at the point of contact and latch on and maintain blocks. Despite his lack of weight in the lower half, he anchors well. He is a below average athlete when it comes to movement and flexibility his size is the best attribute in pass protection, but also patient as a pass blocker. I'm pretty sure he will not have a RAS score because he's recovering from injury. So we can't really look at any of those numbers. Basically, that's that's one of the gambles here with Zach Zinter is that you are betting on what you are seeing on film. And you are, he doesn't, one, he doesn't have the chance to prove people wrong with his combine numbers. Two, if he is better than people think, you could get him at a round that you likely couldn't have otherwise because nobody got to see those numbers. So this guy could be a fourth round pick or a fifth round pick, potentially. Some people have him going in the second round. I've seen him definitely mocked as high as the second round. He might be a second round guard. I like him better than I like Christian Haynes, for example, for the Seahawks, for sure. He's in the conversation for me about whether I like him better than Cooper Beebe. Like, I I, th I think Zach Zenner's an interesting prospect. People say his lack of athleticism. I guess I just don't know enough to say that that's the case. What I saw of Zach Zenner was a pretty powerful player who is a good run blocker, tough guy. And I don't know if he has Pro Bowl potential, but he certainly is a guy that seems to me like to have starter potential. So he's a guy to keep an eye on. Next on our list, let's keep going. Um, let's look at, well, let's look at Cedric Van Pran Granger. Lots of names. Cedric Van Pran Granger. I think he's a center only prospect and I'm not as interested in center only, but let me double, double check because I thought some people had him as a guard. Cedric Van Pran. Let's see. Yeah. People have him as a guard as a center only. So let's, let's, let's skip Cedric. No offense, Cedric. Um, I, I'm not going to focus on guard uh, or on center. I think that guard is where I'd like us to spend our time, at least today. Dominic Pooney, a name we have talked about. Let's get a little bit more familiar with him. So Dominic Pooney uh, on Lance Erline's uh, scoring uh, is a 6.20, which will be eventually an average starter. He's six foot five. 313 pounds, 33 and three eighths inch arms, long arms, especially for a guard, 10 and an eighth inch hand. So big hands, big hands, long arms, relatively tall, uh, ran a five, three, five, 40, not the fastest 40, 30 inch verticals, not bad. Eight, 11 broad. He did run the three cone and the, and the shuttle. So we'll be able to look at his RAS score here in a second. Now, keep in mind, he was a tackle in college that we're talking about moving potentially to guard. Lance compares him to Dan Feeney um, as a prospect. He's a guard prospect in Lance's mind with good size and nimble feet, whose pass protection is ahead of his run blocking at this stage. Pooney has a proportional well-built frame, but is a much better on the move and playing with angles and positioning than he is at pushing defenders around. Pooney plays with excellent feel with arm extension and maintains his feel for pass rushers. His mirror and hand placement stymies simple pass rush approaches. 
but inconsistency, inconsistent body control could be an issue for him against athletic sub package rushers. So meaning, you know, sub package being the, the super fast NASCAR guys that they bring in that are kind of edge types of players that they move inside to go against guards and give them trouble. Uh, Lance is saying those could be an issue for Pooney. Pooney appears to have middle round value, but future starting talent for a move oriented scheme. So almost the opposite of how he talked about Zach Zinter, where Zinter is considered maybe a guy you just want in power schemes. If you're doing zone and outside zone in particular, maybe there's less of a fit for someone like Zinter. It sounds like Pooney could be a good fit in that kind of situation. Good movement skills. Um, and in the strengths, he says nimble, nimble feet to be able to be a puller, find second level angles and adjust to moving targets in space. That is what people say about Troy Fautanu, for example. Um, that's one of his real strengths. He's also bigger and you know faster and stronger, um, but worth worth talking about there. If we switch over to PFF and we look up Mr. Pooney, he is 96th on their board. So um, I think that's that is above Cooper Beebe. Again, uh, his run block grade, again, this was as tackle in college. So he played left tackle primarily in college. 2022, he played guard. So 2022, he only played guard, 848 snaps. 2023, 728 snaps at left tackle. So it is worth knowing that in 2022, when he played guard, his grade was 68.6. 2023, when he played tackle, was 80.6. Was that improvement as a player? Was that the position? Don't know. But his pass block grade was a stellar 90.4. Even in true pass set situations, his pass block grade was 87, which is excellent. His run block grade, 72. Uh, his zone grade, 69. His gap grade, 72. So none of those run grades are fantastic. Let's see what they say about him. Pooney is much improved from 2022 to 2023. And if he continues on his current trajectory, he has the power profile and size to earn a rotational role at guard with starting potential. Uh, like start off pretty exciting. And then they kind of tailed off there at the end. Pooney was a no star recruit who played at central Missouri for four seasons before transferring to Kansas, who played left guard and left tackle. In his first season with the Jayhawks, Pooney displayed bad posture and poor pad level. This made him susceptible to rushers and didn't allow him to really maintain blocks. His posture was better in 2023. And although he was still standing taller than preferred, his conscious he's conscious of leverage and dropped his pads more before contact. He also showed a lot more power in 2023, disrupting and displacing defenders. His power best projects to guard. So... Pooney's an interesting guy in these later rounds to kind of be aware of. And the fact that he's exclusively gotten his snaps on the left side of the line also makes him probably a higher likelihood op option for the Seahawks. Um, worth keeping uh, an eye on that. Let's just check out his Raz score for a second. I believe he did decently on Raz, but I might be wrong. I think they probably have him as tackle. Let's see if I can pull up. Um, Mr. Pooney. Do, 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 do. One second. Well, let me just search for him. Um, is he not in the system? There he is. Okay. Dominic Pooney as a guard. Not the best athletic profile. He gets an 8.16 RAS score, 81st percentile guard. Um, he, where he really fell down was his speed grades. He got poor speed grades. His 40 yard dash was 50th percentile. His 20 yard split was 30th percentile. His 10 yard split was 50th percentile. So he got average, but he had that one 20 yard split that was pretty low. But, 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 what do we talk about being the most important athletic grading numbers for correlating to success for guards in the NFL? Shuttle and three cone. So your agility drills are what have historically correlated most with success in the NFL as a guard. 
He had elite numbers. His shuttle grade, as 4-4, is 99th percentile. His three cone grade, 747, 94th percentile. So that is pretty appealing and pretty interesting. If this is a guy that you believe you can develop, it's not hard to add weight. And he already showed his ability to gain strength from one year to the next. This could be a pretty interesting guy. His explosion grade was also great, not elite, but great. He had a 85th percentile vertical jump and an 83rd percentile broad jump. His size was good. His bench press at 26 reps was, was 70th percentile, but his weight at 303 pounds, 35th percentile. So you basically have a guy that is not big enough. He's not strong. Like he's not heavy enough. That's of all the problems to solve, that is not one that's hard to solve. If you can take a guy with elite agility and add 20 pounds to him, that's an interesting prospect for me. So this is a guy that I like more after this conversation than I did coming in. I, I liked him before. I was interested. But some of those tidbits about who he's like who he's been in college, I think make him a pretty interesting option, especially if you can get him in like the fourth round. I don't know if you could get him in the fifth round, but if you get him in the fourth round, I think that's a pretty interesting guy for the Seahawks. Let's keep going. Uh, if you haven't already, great time to give the show a like and click subscribe. We are, you know, trying to get closer and closer to 10,000 subscribers on YouTube. We are closing in. We just need a few hundred more to get to that. So please click subscribe. And then, Go to patreon.com slash hawkblogger. If you want the audio version of all these podcasts, only way to get them is to be a patron at patreon.com slash hawkblogger. I am posting them immediately after the shows are over. So, you know, there's been times in the past uh, on our podcast, we've it's been a ragtag crew. We've had interns, you know, everyone's unpaid here. So uh, people just do it when they're able to. And so sometimes we do a show and a few days go by before it actually shows up on the podcast um, platforms to, to listen. And that sucks. I get it. You know, but we're all busy um, for this. I am doing it myself. And so I am posting these pods immediately. In fact, I'm also doing some a little bit of audio touch up to help, especially when there's guests and trying to get rid of whether there's breathing or other things so that you get clean audio and good experience there. Patreon.com slash Hawk Blogger is the place to do it. And you get access to the Slack channel where there's conversations going on all the time. People are trading their mock drafts. They're asking for feedback. People are going on and on. Uh, if you want to talk Mariners, if you are that kind of person who enjoys pain, uh, there is a Mariners channel. There are Kraken channels. There's all sorts of channels to talk Seattle sports as well. Uh, patreon.com slash Hawk Blogger is a place to do it. And then we also, YouTube members, we're growing and growing and growing. The link is in the chat. Join as a YouTube member. And as I said at the beginning of the show, if you are a club level or a suite level member, I added a perk as of yesterday that YouTube approved, which is if you're a club level or suite level YouTube member, and I tell you that we've got some more time and I'll take questions, I will look in chat and take questions from club level or suite level members during shows. Um, so you have to be a club level or suite level member to get access to that. All right. Let's go into the next part of our list. I want to hunt a little bit here. Um, I got to look at this. There's a few guys I just don't know well enough, and I want to learn about them. So um, let's jump around a little bit. Let's jump around. I'm going to go, and we're going to talk about Brandon Coleman. Okay, this is a guy that has some crazy crazy athletic profile numbers. And I want to hear what he's like as a player. He's from TCU. He is gets a 6.0 grade from Lance Erline. Not great. He has the traits or talent to be an above average backup is how that uh, profiles out to. He is six, four and a half, 313 pounds, 34 and five eighth inch arms. Those are long ass arms. 10 and three quarters inch hands, big hands, long arms, big hands. Um, 
ran a 499 40 yard dash, 173 split, 34 inch vertical, 96 broad. I'm betting those are going to be some impressive numbers when we get to his Raz. What does Lance say? He says he's a three year starter and team captain in 2023. Outstanding length and the potential to offer roster flexibility. Coleman will be scouted and drafted as a guard, but might be able to handle a move to tackle in an emergency. He's broad and fits up blocks with pretty good accuracy. And when his hands are right, he's never going to be a lane clear. Sorry. He blocks up pretty good accuracy when his hands are right, but he's never going to be a lane clearer in the run game. Coleman's experience at tackle helps his chances at protecting NFL quarterbacks as a guard. His pass protects with efficient hands and sound technique, but his reactive athleticism is very average, which could be trouble against sub package rushers. Interesting. Um, so sounds like not the strongest dude. And if we look on PFF, where does Brandon Coleman show up? Let's, I think he's well down. Well down the list. Brandon Coleman is 231st on the PFF board. That is way, way down. Almost not draft worthy level player. Okay. And I'm going to tell you in a second why we're talking about this guy. Some of you already know, but I'll tell you if you don't. He, by the way, you know, uh, 66320 is what they've got, but, um, his pass block grade, 64 and a half. His run block grade, 55 and a half. Neither one of them particularly good. His true pass set pass block grade, when they know that it's a pass play, 45.9. That is not good. Um, interestingly and worth noting, in 2021, he played 432 snaps at left guard. In 2022, he played 997 snaps at left tackle. In 2023, he played 465 snaps at left tackle and 255 snaps at left guard. It doesn't say here, these grades are overall, so it doesn't say how he profiled as a guard versus tackle, but let's take a look. Um, I will say one clue, potentially, that 2022 year when he played exclusively left tackle, he had by far his highest grade at 79.6 for the season. Last year when he played more guard, um, 57 points. He didn't play more guard, but he played more guard than he had the previous year. Um, 2022, 21 was the year he played the most guard, and that's when he had a 66.8 grade. All right. So they don't have any analysis of him here, but let me talk to you about why. Brandon Coleman, if you look at his RAS score, you will understand why he's getting conversation. Brandon Coleman has a 9.97 RAS score. Now, why does that matter? Um, let me tell you where that, where that lands overall. So that ranked fifth out of 1,523 guard prospects from 1987 to today. Number five. So the, the fifth ranked guard prospect as an athlete since 1987. That's of note. Um, where do those numbers come from? Well, his speed grade is elite. 96, 97th percentile, 40, 95th percentile, 20 yard split, 94th percentile, 10 yard split. His agility grade. What do we talk about? Shuttle three cone, important for guards, elite. 87th percentile shuttle, 96th percentile three cone. Explosion grade, elite. Vertical. 98th percentile, almost 99th. Broad jump, 98th percentile. His size grade is only good. 75th percentile height, 70, well, 60, 65th percentile weight. Did not do bench. So from an athletic perspective, this guy is off the charts. 
but his production, his actual play does not look good, does not look strong. Um, and so, you know, he's the kind of guy that you take a flyer on in the sixth round potentially and hope he can develop into something because he's this athlete. But this should not be your plan A and probably should not be your plan B. I mean, last year, Anthony Bradford was a pretty elite prospect. I want to look up Mr. Bradford where he was. Hold on. I think I can do this relatively quickly. Anthony Bradford. Yes, Anthony Bradford last year, um, he ranked 30th out of all the thousands of guards from 1987. So he also had a very high athletic grade. He was 9.8, whereas uh, Brandon Coleman's 9.97. And he was elite on speed. He was only good on agility. He was great on explosion. He was good on size. But the difference with between Anthony Bradford and you know, Brandon Coleman is Anthony Bradford played at LSU and Anthony Bradford was a reasonably good guard that had some things on film that were really impressive. He like physically dominated some people. I don't think you can make that case for Brandon Coleman um, and his tape at TCU. So I think Brandon Coleman's an interesting guy. I don't think Brandon Coleman is someone that they should be targeting in early rounds. All right, next. Um, I'm going to climb down this list a little bit farther. There's a guy that we've talked a lot about that is well lower on Lance Zerline's list, and this is Mason McCormick. Guard out of South Dakota State. Mason McCormick does not even get a grade above six, okay? He gets a... 5.86 grade, which means he'll be an average backup or a special teamer. All right. McCormick is six foot four, 309 pounds, 33 and seven eighths inch arms, 10 inch hands. So pretty long um, uh, for a guard. His combine results 5.840, 171 split, 35 and a half vertical, 99 broad, three cone drill, 759, 20 yard shuttle, 445. We'll come back to what, what that matters there. Let's hear what Mr. Zerline says about Mason McCormick. Three-year team captain who brings an incredible amount of starting experience and toughness to the table. McCormick plays with tightness in both his upper and lower half that shows itself when forced to make athletic plays. He can be forceful into first contact, which I've seen personally when I've watched him play, but doesn't display the flexion needed to redirect his weight quickly or play with leverage at the point of attack. He's stiff. In other words, his clear eyed pass protection will attract offensive line coaches and his NFL scouting test scouting combine testing should have coaches believing there is still much more to bring out of him as a player. Strengths. He put on a show as, on athletic testing at the scouting combine rare durability started 57 consecutive games in college creates momentum and bangs into opponents on short pulls. I saw that a lot, which is what got me excited. He like he blows some dudes up on pulling plays plays with clean eyes and good twist recognition and pass pro good upper body strength to forcibly redirect pass rushers on the, on his edge weaknesses, feet are mechanical and lower bodies too stiff could consistently struggle to leverage and drive opponents, poor athleticism, reacting to defender against slants off the snap, Richard up Richard upper body creates limited mirroring success against active rushers. will have a hard time protecting against, inside counters i'm gonna see i'm gonna do a quick test here and see if i can find um brandon thorn nfl mccormick do you have anything Have anything on him? I don't know if I've seen anything. Let me take one more quick look. Uh, Brandon Thorne, Mason McCormick. Um, yeah, 
here is a scouting report from February 20th on Mason McCormick. Okay. Uh, thick through the chest and core with good arm length has solid square power and grip strength to quickly dissipate force latch and hold point against defenders does his best work as a mover as, on the mover as a puller where he can deliver a jolt and create immediate displacement on smaller targets clear eyes to recognize and sort basic lines games and stunts plays with physical aggressive mentality to finish the echo of the whistle through the echo of the negatives upright playing style with richard rigid disjoint disjointed and redirect Skill levels leave him high and easily manipulated out of position and space. Struggles to keep defenders centered and controlled late in the rep. Uh, overall, four-year starter, multiple run schemes centered around A-gap power, G-lead, and zone runs. McCormick is thick through the chest and core with good arm length and solid athletic ability. Has a thick build and good length and solid square power that he uses uh, to hold the point and angle drive blocks and deliver immediate displacement. He finishes through. Yeah, we already read about this. Um, what do you think? So he grades him as a 6.0, a fifth round prospect, overall rank 159, IOL 22. So he's not huge on him. If you go into PFF, look there. Um, He is much higher for PFF. He's ranks 94th on their board. He had a 91 run block grade and 85 pass block grade. He was very good in zone 95 grade. And that's the highest grade I've seen in zone blocking 79, 80 grade, essentially in gap when it was a true pass set, his pass blocking grade dropped to 72. So not as strong of a pass blocker, but his overall grade for 2023 was 87 and he has played exclusively as a left guard in his career. Um, all his snaps at left guard. So that's of note for the Seahawks. Yeah, so this is a guy we've talked about in the PFF draft simulator. You're getting, you know, you have to take him in like the fourth round. Um, it might be that this guy is available later. I mean, some of these scouts are, are pretty low on him. If you want to talk about his RAS score, um, it's pretty crazy i mean he has brandon coleman level athletic traits but he has better film so mason mccormick is a 9.96 um and let's give you where that ranks um all time that ranks seventh out of 1,523 guard prospects from 1997 on. Um, he had elite speed grade, all 90th percentile or above. He had elite agility, which is interesting for a guy that are talking about being stiff, but I think the stiffness is different. Like I think he moves and I think that's why he can be a puller and could be a fit in a, in a zone scheme, but he's a little bit stiff and, and maybe not as good in targeting in space would be one way to think about that. His agility grade though is elite 97th percentile in shuttle 87th percentile in three cone. Um, his explosion grade is elite 99th percentile in vertical 99th percentile and broad his size is just good 70th percentile height 55th percentile in weight so again athletes a little bit better film than like a brandon coleman but a developmental guy not the guy that you're going to bring in and place at left guard and hope that he can start next year that is not who this guy is um just catching up here seeing uh other pieces so Let's keep going. If you guys are good, it seems like you guys are still good. We're, we've just gone through a number of guys, but I want to, there's so many more to, to, to check in on. Um, another name for me that's on this list. Let's get all the way back up here. So we talked about Dominic Pooney. Should we talk about Matt Goncalves? Maybe we should. Let's take a look. Let's take a quick look. He is a tackle that could potentially be a guard. He's six foot six, 327 pounds. So bigger dude. 
33 inch arms, which is good. Nine inch hands, not the biggest. Um, he is largely, he's only really played tackle. Uh, interesting comp from Lance Zerline is Jeff Schwartz guard beefy lineman with experience at both tackle spots who should be able to transition inside if needed. He is not a natural knee bender and lacks leverage as a projected guard, but has the mass and power to execute blocks inside. He's a decent athlete for his size, but limited as a move blocker. He's sound in pass protection with the only real issue being his inability to change direction quickly against counters and twists. Gone Calvez might be a sh might get a shot to prove himself at tackle early in his career, but limited foot quickness will shrink the margin for error. The physical traits and two position potential could make him a middle round pick with eventual starter potential. Um, interesting. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, let's see what Mr. Brandon Thorne has to say about Matt Goncalves. Here we go. I'm going to scroll all the way to the bottom on him. Um, overall, is a two-year starter inside Pittsburgh's balanced 50-50 run pass split zone-based scheme that operates under center and shotgun with extensive multiple tight end formations. Goncalves had three starts at left tackle before suffering a season-ending injury against West Virginia. He has well-rounded thickness throughout his frame with a flat, unimpressive build. Glad I don't, people don't actually evaluate my build. I would hate to see what they'd say. Middling lateral quickness and solid play strength. He's a functional run blocker with good initial quickness out of his stance that combines with accurate, strong hands to establish first meaningful contact on angle drives and base blocks to widen and laterally displace his man. He reworks himself well on blocks to sustain, adjust, and secure rush lanes. Struggles to get to his landmarks. In pass protection, has a crafty approach with light active hands enough girth and strength to grind down rushers once latched. He's physical, aggressive, when uncovered to punish adjacent rushers. Struggles staying inside out against widely aligned rushers who know how to set up their moves and stutters, hesitations, and tempo. He can get caught on his heels against the long arms and be tardy, regaining his balance to deal with counters. Overall, competent blocker due to snap timing, due to his snap timing, positional leverage as a run blocker and solid play strength but his mediocre quickness and agility make it difficult for him to protect his edges consistently, which suggests he'll likely be a swing backup at either tackle or guard with upside as a spot starter. He's only given a 6.1 grade, largely the same as McCormick high level developmental prospect, fifth round grade 21st ranked interior O-line prospect. Okay. So, I don't know if we'll go farther there. I want to at least touch on him. Uh, what about... I'm going to do a quick check myself here. Um, now, this guy's only played tackle. I'm not going to... I'm not going to do tackles. Um, yeah. All right, next guy on the list. Uh, all right, let's talk about Mr. We've talked about we've talked about Christian Mahogany Mahogany before. We're gonna go back and do a little more depth. Let's talk about someone we spent less time on. Uh Sataawa Laumea um from Utah. This is uh, uh Lance Derline gives him a six one six grade, good backup with potential develop, develop in a starter. Um he is six foot four, 319 pounds, 32 and seven eighths inch arms, nine and seven eighths inch, seven eighth, seventh, seven eighths inch hands. Uh, four year starter with extensive experience at both right guard and right tackle. Lame is a very competent drive blocker, possesses adequate agility and athleticism to get lateral landmarks on the move. He can get from block to block as a climber. Generally conscientious of his footwork to bolster his success in positional blocks. His habit of oversetting and opening inside tracks to a pocket is a concern, whether he's tackle or guard. One issue that might not be correctable is per his propensity for disengaging from blocks after initial contact rather than sustaining. Laumea fits all run schemes and has future starting potential at guard. 
curious. I'm going to hop over to Mr. Thorne here. Um, and we are talking about... Let's get down here. So he's got him graded a little bit higher than the other two guys. He got him at 6'5", which is a potential role player contributor. A fourth round. He's his 18th ranked interior O-lineman. Um, overall, Laume is a thick, stouty built blocker with twitch, fluid movements, and heavy hands who often plays with an over-aggressive frenetic style that leads to clean, glaring losses across his face. Laumea offers core starting guard traits to work with, but after 44 collegiate starts and the same struggles to connect on target, consistently showing up in at the senior bowl, appears to have ingrained some bad habits. That could land him as a depth spot starker, starter who can stick in the lineup if the coach can cue and instill more tact and patience in his game. So that's kind of concerning, not, not as appealing, but um, worth being aware of. Uh, let's talk Christian Mahogany. Uh, a lot of folks have thoughts on him. Um, I'll just tell you my thoughts on Mahogany before we get into this. Mahogany feels like Anthony Bradford a little bit. Um, solid, strong dude. Maybe limit. I think, uh, Mahogany feels to me a little bit more limited as an athlete than Anthony Bradford, a little bit more plotting, but a big dude, um, nasty, maybe a, a fit for the way the Seahawks like to find players. I don't see, I don't see like elite upside for him. So, and, and with people talking about him going in the third round, I'm just not sure I'm as excited. I think I'd be, I put him and Cooper BB in kind of the same category. I wouldn't be upset with them having him, but I feel like it's a little bit of more of the same for the Seahawks, as opposed to if they were to get a Graham Barton, Troy Fautanu, that feels like a very different class of player at the position. And so that's why still I am a fond, I'm fond of the strategy of going guard in the first round after trading back um, and then taking, you know, a, a defensive tackle in the second round. If they have moved back far enough to get a second round pick, can get a Michael Hall Jr., can get a Trevondre Sweat potentially. We'll see. That's kind of my continued draft preference. But let's see what others say about Christian Mahogany. Boston College, six foot three, 314, 33 and a half inch arms, 10 and a half inch hands, so big hands. Um, he is given a 6.16 grade by Lance Zernline, which is good backup with potential to develop into a starter. Um, he says he is big and powerful, but lacking the leverage and body control needed to play a more consistent brand of football. Mahogany's early tape was very problematic due to shoddy footwork caused by poor stance, but he made a midseason self-correction that led to better tape this year. Um, he doesn't have the short area movements to be a consistent pass protector against sub sub packages in the NFL, but the hand usage and punch are good. Mahogany is a downhill mauler who needs to continue his technique work, but also needs to play for a team that values big power players and allows them to do what they do best in the run game. He has a chance to be a back, backup with upside early in his career. Let's see what Brandon Thorne says about him. Um, let's hopefully I spelled that right. Yes. All right. So Brandon Thorne. He gives him a 7.2 grade, high level backup, potential starter, third round grade. He is his 10th ranked interior offensive lineman. He compares him to Robert Hunt, who just signed a big deal. Overall, Mahogany is a big, powerful, tone setting presence at guard who can oppose his will in a downhill, vertical based run game centered around uh, RPOs, run pass options, and play action. However, he will need to learn to add patience and polish to his footwork to become more of a steady presence rather than a pure bouncer. For anyone that has questions, vertical-based run games um, are going to be climbing to second levels vertically as opposed to outside zone where you're going horizontally. And so that was where I was talking about with Jackson Powers Johnson earlier in the show. He's a guy that I think 
fits that vertical kind of run game. I think there's a little bit more question about whether he fits in. You're going to do outside zone. And so interesting, Brandon Thorne's quite high on Christian Mahogany. That's a that's a positive there. I, I respect Brandon Thorne's perspective. And then if we go over to um, PFF, he is 92nd on their big board. He has a 74.5 run block grade, 82.2 pass block, zone grade 67, gap 73. His true pass set, pass block grade goes up to 80.6. Um, so that's good. Or well, I don't know if it goes up, but it, it's it's a good one. Um, he got all his snaps at right guard, got some at right tackle, but has not played on the left side. I think that's of note for the Seahawks. Not sure if there's any issue with him switching over, but he has not played left guard. Um, they say Mahogany is a guard only and powerful run blocker with inconsistencies in the passing game. He projects into a rotational and potential starting role for a team that is heavier in the run game in mostly man gap concepts. All right, folks, we might do one or two more. Uh, let me check chat. Uh, people want me to do Zach Frazier. I see that. Are there any YouTube members or uh, patrons that um, are, if you're a YouTube member and you are a club level or suite level, and there is a prospect you'd like me to look up, let me let me know. Um, can do that. Um, otherwise, let's look. I'm just checking to see if there's anything else in chat. A good reminder: please give the show a like, click subscribe. Would appreciate that. And go to patreon.com slash hawk blogger, sign up now, get access to the Slack channel, get the audio version of all these podcasts. You want to do that. And you can join as a YouTube member really quickly, really easily. Click the link that's in the chat. It's pinned and it's in the description of the video. You can join as well. Um, all right. Well, if I don't have any other requests, I will do one more player, I think, and it's going to be a player of my choosing. I'm not going to do Zach Frazier. I think of him as just a center, and I know some people say he can play guard. Uh, I've talked to a number of folks that don't necessarily think that guard's his best spot, so I'm not going to do Mr. Frazier. If it had been a YouTube member, I might have done that, but I'm not going to do that. I am going to scroll down the list at some of these other names that I've been interested in learning more about. Um, well, let's actually do this. Let's look at some rap regard. Comes out on top that we have not already talked about. So Graham Barton, Brandon Coleman, Mason McCormick, Jarrett Kingston. We have not talked about Jarrett Kingston. He has a 9.92 Raz. Where is Jarrett Kingston? I'll look here. Huh. <laughs> I wonder if he's listed anywhere on here. Yeah, here we go. He gets a 5.69 grade from, from Lance Zerline. Uh, candidate for bottom of the roster at practice squad. Six foot four, 306 pounds, 32 and eighth arm, nine and three quarter inch hands. 502, 40, 173, 31 and a half inch vertical, nine, three broad, seven, five, three, three cone, four, four, seven, 20 yard shuttle, 32 reps on the bench press i'm looking at him now he seems seems light um he does move pretty well all right let's see uh lance airlines is offensive lineman who has the grit play strength and know-how to play guard but his size and length could prevent it kingston has been well trained in pass protection with steady posture and quick hand strikes but could have issues when he's on an island and forced to defend both gaps as against an athletic rusher he's capable of making zone scheme blocks interesting and does an admirable job of sustaining run blocks for as long as possible. While he never played the position in collegiate game, Kingston's future in the NFL might rest on his ability to prove he can snap and move to center. Worth noting, this guy is USC. So Ryan Grubb and Scott Huff know him well. 
Um, has athleticism to make outside zone blocks on the first and second level. Every run rep features strain that offensive line coaches love. Um, weakness is not built to win battles against two gapping tackles. Narrow power zone allows defenders to work around him. All right, let's see if Brandon Thorne's got anything to say on Jarrett Kingston. Okay. I don't know if he's done one on this guy yet. <laughs> That's not necessarily good. Um, okay, let's check PFF. Oh, yeah, PFF didn't even have him listed, I don't think. I don't think he shows up in PFF. So let's just look on the Raz, um, just to be aware. Like, I love a deep sleeper. You never know. He has 9.92 on Raz. He has elite speed grades, uh, all 93rd percentile or higher. His agility grade is, is he did not do enough to qualify, but his shuttle grade was 96th percentile. So there's very rarely you're going to have someone who's 96th percentile in shuttle and then not be 90th percentile plus in three cones. So my guess is he's, he'd be pretty high there as well. Explosion grade is elite, 93rd percentile or higher in both vertical and broad jump. His size grade is just okay. His weight is four and a half, 40, 45th percentile. His bench is 93rd percentile, though. Um, height, 70th percentile. So you got a light dude here who's got some interesting athletic traits. And I just wonder, he played at a high level, uh, high level school. He played in the Pac-12 where you've got a coordinator and an offensive line coach that know him. He doesn't seem to have... Um, a lot of people thinking high low, highly of him is Jarrett Kingston, a guy, maybe he's even an undrafted free agent, but is this a guy that makes sense for the Seahawks to potentially have interest in as a developmental player? He doesn't, his, his frame looks a little bit, I don't know that he's going to put on a ton of weight, um, but I wouldn't be surprised if he could put on 15 pounds. I'm looking at him here. I think that seems possible. So I'm going to end there on Jarrett Kingston, um, a guy that that uh, no one has talked about. I certainly haven't, but is interesting um, getting one of these super, super late dudes um, on the list. And I don't know about you. I, I, I come out of this still feeling like while there are a lot of interior offensive line prospects in this draft that have some promise, some really interesting athletes. If they're not named Troy Fautanu or Graham Barton or Talis Fuaga, who I just don't mention because I just don't think there's any chance he'll be there, but who knows? Then I don't think we're talking about difference makers, especially in 2024. I think I'm not even super high on the developmental upside of some of these guys. Of the guys we talked about, you know, Christian Mahogany Mahogany to me seems like the most projectable as a starting NFL guard who can have a decent floor and maybe can develop into a powerful enough player that he can be a factor for you. Outside of that, I mean, looking back at our list that we went through, I mean, Mason McCormick's interesting to me. Um the stiffness is a real deal and being stiff in the NFL can be a killer, but I love, I've loved his athletic profile in terms of being able to get out. I'm more interested in guys that are fits for these outside zone types of plays. I think that's where Kenneth Walker, the third is at his best is getting on the edge and being able to really hit it. K nine was the running back for university of Washington last year, instead of Dylan Johnson. Do you realize how many more yards Kenneth Walker would have gained? I mean, he would have housed a number of these outside zone runs. Um, and then there are these inside plays where Zach Charbonnet can be a good, good, good player. So um, I guess I'm looking back here. I mean, 
Goncalves was a guy that's interesting to me. Puni, I think Puni was a guy that I, I left with a little bit more interest in given where he's played and basically just needs to add some size. Um, so both of those guys are pretty interesting. I'm still a Zach Zinter guy. I still think Zach Zinter is a good fit for the Seahawks and could be had later. I don't think Christian Haynes is the best fit for the Seahawks. I am not a huge Cooper BB guy. I do think Jordan Morgan is interesting. He is a guy that you could bring in with the focus of being a guard, but he also acts as a hedge potentially as a tackle. He has some, certainly some tackle capabilities and upside, but could be an interesting athlete at guard. So those are the guys that kind of jump out to me. Um, everybody, I would love to get that like and subscribe for the show. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Hawk Blogger Mornings. Uh, tomorrow, I will be live again, probably a little bit earlier, although tough. I am uh, single parenting here. Whenever my kid wakes up and needs attention, I got to deal with that. So we'll, we'll play it by ear, but we will be on tomorrow morning, keeping the streak alive. And I uh, can't tell you exactly what's going to happen tomorrow. I haven't decided what I want to talk about tomorrow. If you have requests, please feel free to share on my way. One thing that I'm thinking about doing is going back and um, looking at our division rivals and where they are and where their position groups are and what positions they've added to and changed and what their targets might be in the draft. So that's one topic I may be getting into or will be getting into at some point soon. Otherwise, uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, this is Brian Nemhauser. This has been another episode of Hawk Blogger Mornings. Have a great rest of your Tuesday.